All good. Hello, Lewis. Hello, Joshua. How, How are, are you? you? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> very, very, very eager. Oh, I'm good. There before you. I'm good. How I'm, are you? I'm, I'm well. I'm doing all right. It's a lovely day today. It's a fantastic day. It's a very sweaty day. Mm. Bit, uh, bit, you know, bit humid, I think. Oh, maybe too hot. Who knows? Maybe. Maybe. Um, welcome to, um, I don't know what I'm kind of gesticulating towards here. Welcome to uh, my house. Uh, well, welcome to the In Your Own Words blog. Uh, thank you for coming on to my blog. I, I, really, I, I really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. I was, um, I've been looking forward to this. Been looking forward. Ooh. Oh, it's God. exciting. Exciting. Um, fa and uh, not only welcome to in, in in your own words, welcome to music that impacted me, which is uh, which is my. I, I have a lot of fun. I always have fun doing these. I love talking about music. I, I, I get very excited talking about music. And um, when I was kind of thinking about who would be interesting to get on to the blog, um, you, you you came to mind quite quickly. Um, your i'd say your uh the, the amount of music you listen to and the different and the different genres of music you listen to i'd i'd suggest is very vast would you agree um i i try to always find new things i um i mean obviously you know everyone always falls into the traps of listening to the same thing over and over again but i think it's good to um really sort of push yourself and try and find something which you haven't really heard before um because um it's sort of there's so much music out there like the amount if you try and think about it it's just it's it's, it's mind boggling like you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of albums get released every single day and of any kind of genre you can imagine i mean most of it a lot of it is shit a lot of it's trash <laughs> awful stuff but there is some always good stuff um and it's because that you can literally just go on Spotify, type in anything, and there will be something. Mm. Um, so I, and I, and so like I always try and keep things fresh. Keep because um, you only have one life. You only have one life and one set of ears to listen to music. So you might as well make the most of it. Exactly. Exactly. It's a very. Um, it is. It is such a. What's the word I'm looking for? It's such a crazy art form in itself. Music. Because, like you said, there is so much of it. There's, there's so much more of it compared to, you know, things uh, like like film. Perhaps I probably go as far to suggest TV. You know, like you said, hundreds of albums are brought out every day. And the thing is, much I suppose like other art forms, the 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 more indie things, the more independent things that don't really get many listens can be just as amazing and just as creatively uh, fantastic as as you know something that's had. A budget, a budget of millions and millions of pounds from a from a big record label. You know, that's what I love about music. Well, the thing is with music is that it's almost like, I mean, I don't like this idea. I, there's the, the the idea that just because something's more obscure, it's got to be better. But with music, because especially now, you know, you can make stuff on a laptop in your bedroom. When something does have a budget of millions and millions of pounds, there is more pressure to sell more copies. And so they need to have a wider audience and therefore it's more likely to take less risks, more likely to play by what they know and play by the numbers. So when you have something which is very limited release, it's more likely to be more adventurous and try different things and do stuff which no one's ever really thought to do. Um, so it's like, it is worth sort of trying to find smaller creators because they are more likely to be very creative with what they do. Yeah, completely. No, completely, completely. You're right. Let's go straight into it then. Let's go straight into it. So, uh, you know how music that impacts me goes. You choose three albums, uh, any any decade. It could be any era, any style of music. Three albums that has in impacted your life the most. So, Lewis, what is the first album you're going to go for today? Well, the the first, well, all three albums are albums that really impacted me around when I was like between the ages of say say 15 and 17 because I think that's very important for your music taste development. Um, and the first album, um, I'll give a brief description before I reveal what it is. I'll make it a surprise. It's, it's funny because like this kind of album, um, I've got it here and I'll show it later. It's like, it's basically a blueprint of pretty much all the music that I mostly listen to 
because it's like it's got some electronic music in there it's got some ambient music it's got some sort of glitchy dance music it's kind of like if i were to give just a general overview of my taste in a broad sense like this is the album um and the um the album is a uh, radiohead's kid a i got it on cd bought it from a charity shop for like two pounds wow uh, yeah it's it's one album i've just listened to so 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 much like um it's, it's I, can't, I can't even tell you <laughs> um and the reason it's sort of very like um important to me specifically is that although i'd listened to some electronic music before um i i think the first proper electronic album i listened to was uh, metronomy's pit pain pay the five thousand pounds you owe great title wow really catchy <laughs> um and i'd listened to i think another album was andrew bayer's it's artificial this was the first proper album i listened to which really made me interested in electronic music properly because I most of the stuff I listened to before then was very much guitar based like Radiohead's earlier stuff like in the Benz and OK Computer and I listened to a lot of like Led Zeppelin and Queen and classic rock but then I listened to this and I thought hmm that's very interesting and I sort of looked into it and also because it had such a wide variety of genres as I said from from like um, ambient to avant-garde jazz to IDM which is intelligent dance music or big brain and I, I listened to the the influences that they had on the album such as they were influenced by Aphex Twin and Warp Records they were influenced by um I think it, it was Miles Davis they were influenced by um experimental classical music with this Polish composer called like Penderecki whose art piece um his main his most famous symphony is called uh, Threnody to the Victims of Hiroshima and it's one of the most horrifying pieces of music you could ever listen to because it's just horrible string strings that just dig into your soul so it made me sort of really made me sort of branch out into lots of different genres and especially sort of uh, stuff on like warp records like Aphex Twin and all this sort of stuff and it made me realize it opened like a whole different world of music to me and that's why it's important wow I, I, if i was to if i was to guess an album that, that not that i'd ever expect i'd be able to guess any album that you bring forward obviously i i would i would guess one of them would have been an apex twin but that's just purely from having discussions with you about um apex twin because you're the only other person i've met in my life genuinely in my life that has referenced apex twin uh, apart from my uncle my uncle loves apex twin um, and he, he he's very he's very very into his music and uh, you know just much, much, much like you. Um, that's really good though. That's interesting. Which so what what year did uh, did that particular record come out? Uh, it came out in two thousand and zero two thousand. Um, <laughs> exactly. But the the ironic thing is that um, although they were very influenced by Aphex Twin and other electronic artists, um, Aphex Twin when asked about this album called it like, like hot trash he called it garbage because whether or not he was being sincere because he's always very tricky in interviews because um the stuff they were doing electronically was like kids stuff to them it was like stuff they were doing when they were 15 mm -hmm. um and by that time by like 2000 you know the electronic music scene was so much more sort of um far advanced to what radiohead was doing with their electronics um, but they were really annoyed because all like the music writers were calling Radiohead gods because they used a synthesizer once and so all the electronic artists were a bit miffed about that right. um, because they thought that it was these you know rock this rock band moving into their territory and taking all the glory um, but it's, I've heard it's been said that sort of Radiohead are either the world's most accessible ex experimental band or the world's most experimental rock band it's like they they really bridge the gap which is why i think uh the album was so sort of so important because it's like it's it's such a sort of a good starting point for people who want to sort of explore different music and uh and another thing i really like about it and something i always look for something i like in, in albums 
is the album art uh, and I really like it when um, an album's art really reflects the sound. Like you could almost hear the album just by looking at the front cover of it. And because the the artist who works with Radiohead called Stanley Donwood actually stays in the studio with the band when right, making the art. So like you you usually have it as like they'll make the album and then they'll ask someone to make the art for them. And they might not even hear the music, they'll just have to come up with something, but he's actually there along with the process. And I think it's one of the, one of the best examples of, um, a, I suppose, a holistic album where it all has the same sort of feel, because it's like, that's why, that's why I brought it. It's like, if you look, look at it, look at it. Um, it's like, let me just take it out of the case to give a bit of a view. Like, if you look at that, that is what the album sounds like. It sounds cold. It sounds dark. It sounds isolated and digital. Like you get a sense of what it sounds like just by looking at it, which is also a good thing. That is that is absolutely fascinating. That is so fascinating. That, that's yeah. That's that's amazing because I've never heard of that happen before. That the album art, the album artwork artist has been in the process with them. That's, that's yeah. That's, that's that's fantastic. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. It's. It's certainly like a far cry of like, uh, because I, I, it's like, um, if you compare it to rap albums of the mid 2000s, where they used like really terrible Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, I love that as well. I think that's brilliant. That's, that was kind of the, um, the kind of the, the trap music uh, mixtape phase, you know, start by artists like 50 Cent and Gucci Mane and, uh, you know, I like that really started this phase of uh, Little B as well at some point. You know, yeah, making these making these albums, which are hot trash. I'm, I'm not, there's no debate in it. They are trash. Okay, that's why. That's why. That's why they're. You know, they're they're they're, they're mixtapes. I guess they're just big mixtapes. Mix the funny thing is, is that you can have like albums of of hip hop albums which are amazing, like some great beats, great great flows on them, but the album cover is like just the rapper like surrounded by like early 2000s like explosion effects and and really bad clip art and i just think that's br brilliant yeah sort of Did you, um, there was a controversy recently with pop smoke well, i don't know if you saw this with his album I, I i saw it vaguely about the album something about his ear or it wasn't good or something like that well, essentially, so <laughs> they, I'm laughing at now, remembering, they hired Virgil, um, what's his last name? The guy who owns Off-White, the, the luxury clothing. Yeah. Supposed to Virgil, be, uh, I, 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 is it Virgil Abloh? I can't remember. But anyway, he's supposed to be. Uh, Virgin Abloh? Virgil Abloh? Yeah, it might be. Yes, it might be, it might be. He's supposed to be this, this forward-thinking, fantastic designer that's, that's brought in for lots of different things because he's he's such a creative he's so amazing and they hired him to design the album artwork and oh my god it it was absolutely terrible it was as though like a year seven in in, in an ict lesson had just got to grips with with, with paint and uh had, had had moved an image of pop smoke across and lots of random chains and diamonds but they but th it wasn't textured there was no layering to it they were just a, like over him it was it was terrible it was almost uh, like the one thing it was missing was like the, it's, it's how do you rotate text in ms paint yeah 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 exactly exactly um <laughs> That, that was quite funny obviously they fixed it they fixed it in the end i can't remember who redesigned it someone re someone fairly famous redesigned the, the album artwork and they went ahead with that one you know but um but that's great it, it, it's interesting something else i was thinking of as well sorry to take it back to hip-hop again i know i'm not supposed to be talking about hip-hop but when you were talking about radiohead it's kind of taking uh coming into that sort of genre of electronic music it reminds me a lot of um on Kanye's beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, a lot of the inspiration for the album and a lot of the, the work on the album um, was done with Bon Iver. And mm. Bon yeah. Iver it was, was renowned for, the, for his really individual sound. Yeah, he did. He had this like folk sound on like, four, I think it's for Emma forever ago. And then it was 22 a million where he sort of went all electronic. Yeah. Yes. And a lot of I remember obviously because I love that album. It's one of my. It's probably well. It's not my favorite. One of my favorite albums that 
But I remember when I read about it, a lot of people suggest kind of a similar thing what you're saying there, that Kanye's kind of taken all of Bon Iver's style, again, tries to put it into kind of a new genre, but he's praised a lot for trying to, for again, being this creative forward thinker, but he's basically just ripped off this, um, this kind of style. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the auto-tune melodies and the, and the symphonies and, um, yeah. which is on the album a lot, you know, um, it reminds me. It reminds me heavily of that. But I, I did not see that coming. Radiohead. I did not see Radiohead coming. They are my all-time favorite band. Like uh, I've, it's because I, I, I've, I've, I feel like you could just listen to Radiohead and you'd get get most of what you need from like rock music. Like if you want their sort of, if you if you're sort of like a a fifteen year old sad boy you can listen to the bends and it's like grunge and it's like all depressing and morose. And then um, if you want sort of more um, folky, they have like sort of folk, they have folk influence songs and they have classical influence songs and they have electronic and then they have like more straightforward rock. And then they have all this sort of, it's just the breadth of what they do is just, um, astounding they can go from a straightforward acoustic ballad to an experimental music concrete sound experiment and it's just that's it's, it's everything you need just in one package when i've uh, when not i mean i must admit i'm not a huge follower or fan of radiohead but i do appreciate how uh, talented they are and how and how much they've brought to um to, to music in general but when i've spoken to radiohead fans before the kind of the consensus i felt is that they were angry that uh, that creep is the 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 really famous <laughs> song considering obviously in their eyes again this is again this has come from someone obviously i don't follow their work that much so i don't know myself but it sounds like creep isn't really one of their best songs yet that is the song that that uh, you know everyone it's, around the world knows. Yeah. It's, it's kind of it's almost like a, a running joke in the fan base about about creep um because it, um it's, it's a, there's a very very complicated relationship for radiohead fans of that song um because it really does not reflect them as a band um because it's from their first album and it's not even the best song on the first album that's the funny thing um <laughs> but it's just so it's like it's from the the very start of their career um and it's it just so happened to be such a big hit and it's not it's a it's all right song like if we're being objective it's an it's a pretty good song it's 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 not bad it's a not a bad song but what i think consternates um the fans is that it's sort of Anytime you try and talk about the band, it's like, oh yeah, I love Creep, but there's just there's so much more to the band than that one song. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of something similar, but nothing really um, comes to mind off the top of my head. Um, perhaps there's some. Well, anyway, so they have all this other sort of music, um, but the, uh, the we almost sort of feel a sort of a defensive obligation to, to to hate the song because also the band hates it and it's like you know we've got to like what the band likes yeah. um but the ironic thing is is that without that song without creep we wouldn't have radiohead as we know it today because but up and like basically their, their entire career up until a certain point especially like with stuff like okay computer and kid a was them trying to move away from that image of that band and the song and sort of reinvent themselves and um so it's like on the one hand it's the one song that everyone knows but on the other it's the reason we have all the great music that they have and also because they were so successful that way they were able to make more albums and and experiment it's it's a double-edged sword it certainly is <clears throat> it's quite it's quite a trend as well i find in music in general that um a lot of fans that do genuinely care about the artist and uh, are, are like serious fans of the artist. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a trend that, you know, the fact that everyone loves their really popular song or their, or the song that might, uh, in, you know, do the, the, do the, the best in the charts. 
uh, is the one that slides the most. And I know it's, it's quite a And I feel the same, though, to be fair. I do, I do feel the same um, about some artists, you know. Um, but I think, you know, I think it comes down to the fact that everyone kind of has their own individual relationship with that artist or with that piece of music they're listening to. And some are just are more protective of that music and their experience of that music than others, is what I think. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure I'm guilty of, of the same thing with other artists. I'm sure I, I just think, oh, this artist just does this song and then they have a wealth of other music. Um, I think the closest I could make, oh, I had an example and then it's gone. I mean, I know, like with Blur and Song 2, mm. um, because especially with Americans, like that's, it's, it's ironic because um, Song 2 was supposed to be taking the mickey out of like radio rock, but then it became the very thing it was making fun of. Um, or with the Beastie Boys and Fight for Your Right to Party, which again was an ironic jab at, at sort of frat boys but then it became an, an anthem for frat boys yeah, yeah. um but there's both artists both the beastie boys and blur have a wealth of other music different varieties but if you say to most people oh what well, name a blur song they'll just go song two woohoo <laughs> yeah yeah <clears throat> excuse me yeah no exactly exactly um let's go on to your second pick then what is, yeah. uh, what is your your second pick for music that impacted me uh, so for my second album, um, so while I was a teenager, you know, you'll feel all the emotions. You, I felt the, the, the isolation and angst of Kid A, but the anger that my, like, I didn't have an emo phase, I didn't listen to emo music, but the song, the music I listened to when I was sort of angry or frustrated as a teenager was uh, Death Grips. And the next one is uh, The Money Store, which I listened to to death when I was a teenager. And it really introduced me to angry music and it's like that really influenced my music taste as well wow death grips death grips are loved aren't they they are absolutely i know i know um anthony fantano <laughs> is a huge fan of death grips isn't he because i, I yeah. even videos that don't that don't even discuss anything to do with death grips you just see comments on all of his videos about death grips yeah and it's it's funny because i don't really listen to them as much as i used to um but I, the reason I chose it is because of the impact it had on my music taste and the, the music I listened to. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because both Radiohead and Death Grips, as much as I love them, I will admit their fan bases are really, really annoying. Like the, I had to, I recently left a Death Grips group because it, I just, it was just, the fans are just, they're not so much dickheads, they're just like very up their own arse. It's, it's, it's like, and it's just, because um there was a similar artist called J Big Mafia, who was an, another sort of experimental hip hop artist, and he just got yeah he got so pissed off by everyone just calling him MC Ride, and he I think it's kind of he, he kind of correctly pointed out that there's there's a sort of subtle sense of racism there, in the sense that he can't be another sort of black artist in a similar space without being compared to this other black artist, and it's like it's just the the group was just like. You know, is this Death Grips? Is this Death Grips? And it's like, uh, basically, as much as I love the music, the fans need to uh, stop. <laughs> it's, again, though, I think it kind of feeds into that um, that protectiveness that people have over music. But on the same token, though, that doesn't mean that they have a right to uh, they d like lo like loving something that's a bit more culty or a bit more like less popular doesn't mean that you're special or doesn't mean that you are better than any other music listener you know it just means that you have a different sort of relationship with that with that group it's know? it's got it's got the similar the same sort of vibe as those guys who are like yeah i'm really into film have you heard of pulp fiction you probably haven't heard of it <laughs> yeah yeah the, the the mad film uh the mad film nerds that love kubrick and like, like you know they can't talk about anything else apart from kubrick well, I do like Kubrick. I mean, I mean, let me just, I've got, you know, I've got, I've got his collection, but you know, but there are other directors, other directors are available. Um, <laughs> I like Kubrick. I don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of Kubrick, but I find, yeah, I find the big director that they all love is Tarantino. Like oh. they, they, they keep going on about Tarantino, but yeah, Kubrick is another one. Um, and, uh, and, um, oh, what's he called? Wes Anderson. Yeah. 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 
But I think I think maybe not so much with Wes Anderson. I, I, I think the people that love Wes Anderson genuinely do love Wes Anderson. They do think he's a creative genius. Yeah. Um, I think with Tarantino, it's a bit because it's because a lot of like popularist people again that aren't like so much into film as other people love Tarantino. I feel like the whole like loving Tarantino thing is kind of in itself a bit of like a meme. Um, it is, yeah. You know, not just amongst like film people, amongst like you know everyone. But... It's the thing is, it's become such a like a, a cliche now. It's like you, it, I've found to the point where I'm like. I, I'm scared to admit that I like Tarantino's films for fear of looking like a cliche. Yeah. Um, he's not my favourite director, but he's a good director. It's like, it sort of becomes, it, it's, it's, uh, what I just okay, what I don't like is people who, you're allowed to dislike stuff. That's not, you know, there's you know you're not allowed to there's no obligation to like everything but i don't like people who dislike things and hate on things just because it's cool to do yeah. like um bring you back to the radiohead thing there is a, among certain music c crowds there is a trend to dislike radiohead because they're so popular among those crowds and you know i'm sure there are people who don't like their music but the, you get a sense from some people it's just like they're doing it because it makes them it there's a real problem and this links back to the sort of the death grips fan base of people who have to be like the edgiest edgelord or top dog or they know the most obscure stuff mm. so they won't admit to liking popular things because it ruins their like cred you know what i mean yeah yeah no completely no completely and i, I get you it is, it is kind of um it is kind of in itself a bit of like a, a personality, isn't it? I guess. But, well, some people treat it anyway as like a bit of a personality to be this kind of, you know. I'll I tell you, I, sorry, sorry. I always bring these kind of metaphors and things back to hip hop. That's just because that, that's the genre I, I know. And well, yeah, that's what you know. So it's like, that's what you can frame it in. Yeah, but with, with Odd Future and Tyler the Creator, okay, before you know, before Tyler the Creator it was Tyler the Creator as we know him now, back in like 2013-ish when he, he just released Goblin and stuff, you know, like oh, like liking Odd Future and liking them was seen to be this like indie kind of thing, like, oh, you know, it's so cool. But then soon as a lot of other people get hold of it and he moved on and he progressed from all of his old um, uh, Bastard and, and Goblin um, albums that he did and stuff and other people liked them you know that a lot of people just kind of um, turn it turned it into a kind of oh you don't know what future you don't like Tyler you weren't you didn't skate with us when he went when on future did this on TV or when they said this or when they did that you're not a skater you know and it, and it becomes like such a personality trait uh, and I, my memory now is going back to someone in particular I remember at school you know as soon as I caught wind because I caught wind of them late okay I'm, I'm not gonna I wouldn't claim to be like an original son and his attitude towards me because I started liking them was like he, he, he couldn't he couldn't um he was not a he wasn't happy he couldn't stand the fact that other people started to like him and that's very much kind of like what it sounds like like you kind of what you're saying with that yeah there is a big there is a big element of like gatekeeping among certain groups and like you can understand it to a certain extent because it's it is really annoying when you have this thing which you're really passionate about and then a bunch of like people just just because it's cool um and popular will become will come along and sort of say they like it without actually having an understanding of it but you can't sort of say to anyone who's a recent fan well you're not a real fan mm. because then you're just pushing people away and you're looking like a little like troll under the bridge like <laughs> no it's not fair <laughs> I was here first, you know, it's, it's, you have to, it's, it's, it's like you have to be accepting because yes, there will be some fake fans, but then like not every single person, like, okay, so if someone goes to Tyler, the creator, like goes to see him live, I'm, it's, I think it's safe to assume that they genuinely like him. It's like, you know, you can't be, not, not everyone is a, is a, is a poser. Mm. so to speak mm. although um 
No, I won't get into it. It's, that's, that's not go ahead, go ahead. It's your go ahead. It's something you want to. No, it's just it's just because like so it's something I do to as a form of like um so masochism on myself is I'll watch um people um if you go on YouTube and you just look up um vinyl collection or something like that, ninety percent of them are like um these sort of uh trendy girls who shop at urban outfitters. Um, and they always have Crosley turntables, which are just, they're not awful, but like for the money, you're not getting anything good. Like you could spend just a bit more money and get an actual good turntable. Like you, you know, they've just got them for the aesthetic and they always have the same records. They always have like Lana Del Rey. They, for some reason, they always have 21 pilots. They always have um, like Ariana Grande. They sometimes have One Direction, One Direction on vinyl. Like <laughs> you're spending 30 pounds to listen to One Direction on vinyl. Like what are you doing? And they always have like Tyler Creator, Flower Boy. And it's mm. always the same ones. And I know I just, ra you know, just could criticize people gatekeeping, but it's just so funny when you see all these people with the exact same vinyls, like, no, exact same records. That's the thing. They call them vinyls. They're not called vinyls. They're called records. They're vinyl records. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sounding like such a fucking big <laughs> There is still an element of truth to that sort of feeling of people being posers. Well, fair. you know what? I'm feeling personally attacked because I, on this <laughs> blog, I run a, a vinyl of the month. I don't call it records. I call it a vinyl. Um, <laughs> basically, in that segment, um, I started collecting vinyl records very, very recently. And I make it now my effort each month to buy a vinyl record uh, from an album that I love. Um, so each month I buy, I buy a record and I type it and I do, the, you know, I write a little kind of article thing about it. Um, and now you've said that, you know, I'm kind of, I can see my vinyl collection over there. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, maybe I'm the popularist, uh, <laughs> but maybe I do things for the aesthetic. <laughs> I mean, I don't, but um, I haven't got, I haven't got, I'm putting this way, I haven't got very indie vinyl records yet, anyway. Um, yeah, well, I think, I mean, I, I don't collect the records because I don't have the money for it, but I think, uh, a a good a good sort of a good thing to keep in mind when looking for which things to buy on vinyl um is you're going to want to buy stuff with a good dynamic range so like um there's a thing called the loudness wars where ever since even the 60s um album uh, music has been getting louder and louder and louder um but that's at the cost of a thing called dynamic range where the difference between the quietest sound and the loudest sound. Um, so if you listen to like um, Unknown Pleasures now, um, it sounds really quiet compared to modern music because it was mixed much lower, but you get much more range of, of, of sound. So you, you, you hear like much more, like a lot more different stuff. So older records are always good to get on, on, on vinyl because they have a more dynamic range and also things with like a lot of different um uh, things recorded live like jazz records are always very good classical music records that's always worth getting on vinyl um but also stuff with um a lot of bass because you get a warmer sound um like for instance stuff like pop music like ariana grande one direction all this stuff it's not going to sound any different on vinyl because it wasn't mixed for vinyl it was mixed for listening on your bluetooth speaker or in your headphones on the bus but stuff like um prog rock like pink floyd or yes or emerson blake and palmer that's going to sound much better on on vinyl because it was mixed for, for vinyl you got it when, when when buying when buying music formats you have to consider what it was mixed for hmm. i get you that's interesting I've, yeah because I've, I've not um i've never thought of it kind of like that before um and uh, you know i'm sure you're i'm sure you're bang on correct I've, the, the thing the thing with um with a lot of it is that it is a marketing ploy 
because they know that they can charge the, the 30, 35 pounds, you know, mm. however much you want to spend on, on the vinyl, you know. Um, and I know myself, I have maybe three vinyls in my collection that don't, doesn't sound any different to when I listen to it, say, if I open it on Spotify. Yeah. Um, and they're things that I've noticed like straight away. As soon as I've put it, I don't have uh, that brand that you're talking about of Titan Turntable or the Crosley. No, I've, I've got I've I've got a <laughs> mine's almost extinct. I've got a very very old Technics uh, thing. It's like it's like a tower thing with lots of different. Mm. Uh, yeah, the proper the, the proper equipment. Yeah, uh, which does make a difference to the sound. You know, I, it just. Um, it adds quite a, like a rustic sound to it, which which I like, especially like for example, uh, Lauren, Lauren Hill, Miss Education of Lauren Hill. That's one vinyl yeah. I listen to a lot. I li that, that's probably yeah, that's, one not, that's like the kind of album you want to get on vinyl because there's lots of yeah, that's the, the kind of album you want. That's the that's yeah. probably my most played vinyl, and yeah. the the sound quality is just I can't describe it. Like I can't listen to I can't listen to that album now. On like Spotify or anything like that. Well, I can, but you know, I when I do, you, re I really, I can really hear the difference in between playing it on vinyl and, and streaming it, and it's mad. It's crazy. It's um, it's like a whole different experience of enjoying an album. You know. Anyway, we're getting off topic. Yeah. Although I will say one last thing, um, because it's funny because there is um, there's an album, one of my favorite, actually one of my favorite albums. I could choose it for this, but I don't. It's not quite relevant. Um, it's called "It's a Tri Repete" by Orteca. Great IDM album. And um, on the the CD version, it has um, "Incomplete Without Surface Noise." But then, if you get it with surface noise, it's like the noise you get from like stuff like dust and static on a vinyl. But if you buy it on vinyl, it says "Complete with Surface Noise." And it's interesting to think that the makers of the album thought about that. They thought like you know about that as a part of the experience of the album which i think is interesting you know what we, you we are, haven't actually talked about we haven't really talked about well what did you say uh, sorry i was gonna say you are you are uh, you you are uh, a source for for music knowledge you should you should be hosting these these blog pieces with me <laughs> you, 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 you're so you're so intelligent with it. sorry carry on what you're gonna say we haven't actually talked about the money stuff that much no <laughs> no go 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 Okay, so the Money Store released 2012 uh, by Death Grips, um, and it was um, you probably you might actually just cut all of that lot of previous conversation. Who knows? Oh, wow. um, so, so the Money Store 2012, and it came after um, Death Grips's mixtape Ex Military, which is an unbelievable like mixtape. You, I mean, you can't get it on Spotify because of um, samples, but you can download it for free off their website, and I. I implore any person watching this to, to go to go download it because it is amazing. Um, and it was released on Epic Records because for some reason they got signed to Epic, which are known for like their Motown and things like that. It was a very odd signing. Um, but the thing is about um, Death Grips is that they're similar to Radiohead in that every single album sounds completely different from the last. But there is also just that 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 sound, that unmistakable sort of identity that is like either both Death Grips and Radiohead. So Ex Military was very much it had an old school hip hop feel, like it's um, in its sampling. It was very obvious with its samples. It sampled like um, sort of songs from like the fifties and sixties, like Pink Floyd songs and a Link Ray song, um, and it was sort of had this really old school hip hop feel. But then the money store was completely different, um, and but it was it was like much more industrial and and harsh and and sort of like almost but at the same time pop poppy in its structure, like because the thing about the songs is while they're abrasive and they feel like your head getting attacked with a jackhammer, the songs at the same time are incredibly catchy. And the, like, it's just the hooks and the choruses are just so like poppy at the same time and have so much energy. But um, 
it's it's just what it's similar to Kid A in that I'd call it an airtight album. Is that there's no there's no like fat. It's all like just from one from start to finish. It's just a, a continuous experience. It's a continuous experience, mm. and um, I think it's I th and it really sort of that along with a couple of their other albums really introduced me to sort of much more aggressive experimental music and things like that. And it's how I you know got into um, more industrial music uh, stuff like Coil and not so much nine inch nails but like and also um things like uh noise rock and um um other mm, i'm trying to think of other examples but nothing really comes to mind at this current point in time um things like sort of noise rock and 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 drone music and things like that maybe it's not so much drone um but the samples they have are just ridiculous it's just insane like where they come up with this like one song has a sample from an album of music which was found on on mobile phones in like morocco or something like that um another album another song samples a tennis match between serena and venus williams because you know like the the tennis grunts that uh, they took one of those and like they stretched it and distorted it until it's just like this just just mess of noise <laughs> and it's like it's ridiculous like like death grips just seems to play with absurdity so well in like such a way like for instance um their latest album has a spoken word intro on one of the songs from the director of Shrek 2. <laughs> really? I think it's hilarious, yeah. They they had one of the collaborators was the director of Shrek 2, and another collaborator was a noise music artist who cuts himself with glass. It's just it's it's you've got to ask yourself like how self-aware are they when they do this shit? Like because they have this image of this hardcore like no nonsense band and you they must have known they must have been so self-aware and it's like we want to get the director of shrek 2 or shrek one of the shrek films on our albums and you're like there's you don't know how much like they're playing with you on that sort of stuff yeah 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 but <clears throat> in it's in its own right though it's absurd but also how 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 original and how creative and how refreshing is that when we when we're in an age now where a lot of music that's released, um, especially like popular music, it just doesn't sound like much attention has been paid to to to, to the song or to the album. Or they, I feel like nowadays things feel so much more factory made, and sometimes when you listen or you, when you find things like that like death grips and you know we're like <laughs> like this spoken this this spoken word thing it's, it's quite refreshing do you not do you not agree yeah i think yeah they, they they clearly put a lot of a lot of like effort and work into creating these albums which is why it's so crazy that they've managed to release so many in such a short period of time but try and work it out so they they've ex-military came out in 2011 so that was nine years ago so they've released ex-military the money store no love deep web which came out the same year and it's funny because no love deep web was supposed to like they wanted to release it the same year as the money store but epic records wouldn't allow them to and so they thought like we've had enough of this so they they stayed for like a few months in this really expensive hotel in in la basically on on the records on the record uh, labels wallet basically taking as much money from them as could as they could then they released the album for free without telling the record label and the record album cover can um is just it's a penis with the album names scribbled on it and so the record label dropped them so they basically took the money and ran so they okay anyway ex-military the uh, money store no love deep web then it was government plates then uh, N words on the moon, Jenny Death, Bottomless Pit, 
steroids they've released I'd, I'd approximately nine or ten albums 10 plus in nine years but they all have this sort of polished like feel like there's clearly a lot of work has gone into them so you just get a sense that all they do is just focus on the music wow it's, it's i it's just the, the 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 consistency is is remarkable yeah 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 um moving on then we've got one more to go what is yes. your third and final pick for music that impacted me so yeah so the the last album was a bit of a very much a left turn uh, although if you as i get as i said before if you follow the same sort of music groups on on the internet as i do this will not seem like a left turn at all and so around this time that i was listening to radiohead and death grips i was like pop music's awful it's terrible i hate pop music it's i don't care about that but then along came uh, uh, a trio called uh, kiro kira benito with the album benito generation which really made me realize oh wait hang on pop music's great it's just that the pop music you hear on the radio i think the one thing one thing i real i look for in music is sincerity and that i don't care what the genre is or the style as long as the person clearly cares about what the music they're making so so i listen to a lot more pop music now but it's pop music where the person clearly loves what they're doing so with Kira Kira Benito, it's this bubblegum, sunshine, everything's great music. But the, the, the band clearly loves what they're doing and is having so much fun, you can't help but love it. And I think that's what's important. If you're multicoloured, that's cool too. Yes, if you are multicoloured, that is cool too. That is, uh, yeah, so I came, I came across them... Um, when did I come across them? I think, one of, I think Flamingo, which is, which is the song I've just referenced, uh, I think that got put on Majestic Casual, like the YouTube channel, um, hmm. was quite, it like a few years ago, quite, quite a fair few years ago. And that yeah. track is brilliant. Like, mm-hmm. no exaggeration, that track is absolutely brilliant. It's so much fun. The lyrics are, are, are great. They're, they're so creative. The, the production in the, in the song, um, again, it is, it's fabulous. It's, it's, it's a really well put together song that you can have a lot of fun with yeah and i think it's like it's it's important to sort of re- you know remember like if you're just listening to very serious music it's all very serious you know you're allowed to have fun and still listen there is a lot of fun music out there which is still really well made and really good um another example would be like um uh, carly ray jepson um is sort of well known among music circles because like she's like this sort of not quite indie darling, but pop, sort of pop indie. She's like a pop act, but she's a bit un- a little bit underground, but like, like she's clearly puts a lot of effort into her, her music. Like, um, I don't understand how people can listen to like Taylor Swift. Mm. I just, I, it's just, well, maybe like her earlier stuff was good. I haven't really listened to it, but like the stuff now, it's just so, it's like, it's just so formulaic, formulaic and played by the numbers. It's just, you're wa- I feel like you're wasting your time with it. But then you, there is other great pop music like Kira Kira Benito, which is just as poppy. In, in fact, poppier, there's this, um, cause they're, they're sort of semi-linked to, um, I don't know if you heard of it, this uh, group called uh, PC Music. Um, so PC Music was a, is a label uh, set up by a guy called A.G. Cook um, back in the early 2010s in London and their whole um, sort of modus operandi is to create ultra pop music so pop music which is so pop it goes back down around to being underground it's like as as synthesized as auto-tuned as it's almost like the word I use to describe it is glassy it has this sort of coldness to it um and that's really influenced a lot of pop music like with um a big influence was uh, charlie xcx um who uses collaborates with pc music a lot and she really rides the line between experimental and pop music because she'll make she'll make a pop song and then she'll make an experimental song and, and it's like that's really interesting it's this idea of almost like um like um 
ultra reality where something is it's it's there's a there's a there's a word for it but i can't quite think of it at the moment it's it's like more real than real mm. okay okay i get you i get you i, I mean i don't okay. know what the word is <laughs> i don't know what the word is but I, I i understand what i understand what what you're trying to get through kira kira benito then i mean i i know very very little about where where are they from are they, are they american are they so they're from london um British. there's yeah, there's the two two producers are uh, British and the s singer uh, Sarah Nadori, who is another one of these like, you know, she she's everyone's waifu, um, was is British but um, has a Japanese mother and speaks Japanese, and they were looking for for a Japanese singer because the two producers were sort of influenced by Japanese music like J-pop, and it, uh, and I and um and the thing about like. And I think you can definitely sort of hear the, the influence of like J-pop because it is very, because, you know, obviously with Japanese pop, it's very sunshine and happy. Um, but then you have um, K-pop, which I, um, I have a severe disdain for because, because of the same, this very same reason I love Kira Kira Benito is the reason I hate K-pop. It's all, like I said, with sincerity, because with k-pop you know that it's purely manufactured the the singers don't actually really well they want to be there but you know they're not there of their own volition and it's just it's almost it, sounds, it seems almost sort of like dystopian and evil to me the whole k-pop thing um it's like the very antithesis of what i look for in music but i don't know i, I just i just want i needed an excuse to talk about k-pop and how much i hated it but anyway <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I mean, what a vast mix that, that we have there for your for your album piece. It, are there any um, honourable mentions that you'd like to? Oh, there's so many. Um, there's um, Man Alive by Everything Everything, one of the first like properly sort of odd albums I listened to. Thirteen by Blur, another great aggressive noise rock album, except for the first song Tender, which sucks. If you're going to listen to the album, skip the first song. Um, I'd say um, uh, an, an, a recent album which came out, which is brilliant, is uh, Schlagenheim by Black Midi. That was a brilliant album, uh, one of my favourites. Um, I'd say um, uh, Balls of Canada. I've not mentioned Balls of Canada yet. Brilliant band. Um, another same record, same anything on Warp Records. So that's Aphex Twin, Balls of Canada, Square Pusher, um, Music spelled with a mu. Um, Squid, also on Warp Records, another great modern band. Um, I recently had a conversation with uh, Pridge, um, I, and he's like, "Why, why, you know, when my parents were around, they listened to Queen, and now we listen to, you know, mumble rap." And it's like, "Go listen to Squid; they're a great modern band." And then shut up. Um, <laughs> yeah, Boards of Canada, um, this great ambient uh, Scottish duo, and it's like. Uh, a common thing that everyone talks about when talking about the music is like you feel like you've heard it before it feels nostalgic for something you don't really remember but it's like um one thing i really look for in music is is texture and sound and the way something sounds and the thing about balls of canada is that um they they clearly put a lot of they put a lot of work into how something sounds more so than what the music is because a lot of the music is actually quite simple it's quite simple melodies and rhythms but the the the, the everything surrounding it all the all the different um, the soundscapes they create is so part of the whole experience it's clearly so important and it sort of creates sort of mood and um, it's sort of um, which is what I love about ambient music is that it can sort of create these little worlds which don't really, they, they're sort of like alien and odd, like, um, but yeah, um, anything like that. Uh, Forte is really good for that, as is uh, Stars of the Lid. And, um, you know, I could just go on all day about that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah. We would have to get you on again. I'd have to get you on again. Like I said, you know, you know, and also, you, you know, your knowledge and your, like, I imagine you've listened to so many more albums than I have. And it is so interesting listening to, to you talk about music because I can tell that it's something that you genuinely care about and you are passionate about music. 
Yeah, and um, I I feel for anyone who says they don't listen to music, there's a whole world that they're missing out on. It's like saying you don't eat food, you know? It's like, it's there's there's so much. But I don't know, I don't know how many albums you have listened to. I don't know how many albums I've listened to. Um, I, it's 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 important not to not to try and sort of see yourself as superior than more superior than anyone else because that just makes you a dick. Um, <laughs> And if you, you know, it's, if you want to get someone interested in something, you have to sort of, um, you have to, you can't come across as like, as if you're better than them. Yes. As I said, with gatekeeping, like, cause you know, I, I would love it if more people listen to crazy, interesting music, but, um, the, the only way you're going to do that is sort of to get people excited about it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Is there anything that you'd like to plug or uh, anyone you want to shout out to before we um, finish? I'll just plug my Instagram. Uh, it's at Lewis Comber, I think. I post pictures on there of things that I take pictures of because yeah. I like taking pictures of things. Um, and, you know, uh, in the words of Nardwa, uh, keep on rocking in the free world. Uh, and just. <laughs> That is that is a fantastic way to end. Thank you so much, Lewis. Thank you so much for doing this, mate. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you. you again. Thank you. Thank you.